What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Primetime Sports Podcast, hosted by Joey Maylari. So today's episode is just going to be a quick rundown of some happenings in the MLB over the last day or two. I'm going to talk about the Yankees, talk about the Red Sox been doing, Albert Pujols, give you guys an update on the World Baseball Classic, and then I'll also talk about the return of Mike Trout to the Angels lineup. So to start off, I'm going to talk about the Yankees. They're 3-14 and 14 in their last 17 games, so three wins, 14 losses in their last 17 games played. Worst record in the MLB over that stretch, and that's since the MLB trade deadline. Three wins, 14 losses since the MLB trade deadline. They are 1-5 and five in Garrett Cole's stats since the return of the All-Star break. He actually has a 4.62 ERA in stats since the All-Star break, which I saw from Jared Carabas, so credit to him. They are 21-30 and 30 since June 24th. So the Yankees, 21 wins, 30 losses since June 24th. They are winless in six straight Garrett Cole starts, which is actually tied for the longest winless streak, so six starts in a row, of his entire career in a single season. Six straight starts in a row, the Yankees have not won, which ties Garrett Cole's longest winless streak of his career in a single season. The Yankees were 64-28 and 28 heading into the All-Star break and were 36 games over 500. Now, they are 73-48, and 48, nine wins, 20 losses in their last 29 games played since the All-Star break. So, that, you got to look at that. They were 64-28 and 28 before the All-Star break, and are now 73-48. and 48. They are 9-20 and 20 in their last 29 games since the return of the All-Star break. They are 4-14 four in the month of August, being outscored 58-83. to 83. And that's a minus 25 run differential. It's usually the opposite. The Yankees, typically the team that are up 30 games in the run differential category. Since the trade deadline, the Yankees are 3-14 and after trading Joey Gallo, while the Dodgers are 13-3. and Yankees are 3-14, and Dodgers are 13-3. and The Yankees have lost six straight series, six consecutive series in a row, for the first time since August 1995. They had a 15-and-a-half game lead in the AL East at one point. And now only have a seven-game lead. A seven-game lead. Had a 15-and-a-half-game lead, and now only have a seven-game lead. On Friday night, the Yankees were shut out and lost to the Blue Jays 4 to nothing. They have been shut out now five times in their last 14 games played. And after Friday night, they only had 14 runs in their last seven games played, including Friday night. While the Orioles scored 15 runs, Baltimore scored 15 runs on the Red Sox in just one game on Friday night. 15 runs for Baltimore in one game on Friday night compared to the Yankees' 14 runs in their last seven games heading into Friday, or after Friday, that is, after Friday night's game. The Yankees are 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games, the worst record in the major leagues, 5-15 and 15 in their last 20 games, once again, worst record in the MLB over that stretch, and are 10-20 and 20 in their last 30 games played, which is the second worst record in the major leagues over that stretch. 2-8 and eight in their last 10 Five and 15, five wins, 15 losses in their last 20, and 10 wins, 20 losses in their last 30 games played. Second worst record in the MLB over the last 30 games played. Heading into Friday night, the Orioles were 47 and 35 since May 17th, while the Yankees were 47 and 36, the Red Sox were 45 and 38, the Blue Jays were 43 and 37 heading into Friday night, and the Rays were 41 and 39 heading into Friday night. All teams in the AL East, have a 500-plus record since May 17th. But if the season opened up on May 17th, the Orioles would have the best record in the AL East and would be in first place. The Orioles really have turned things around, and I talked about this already before. What the Orioles have been doing with one of the lowest payrolls in baseball, and if you look at it, they're second lowest right now in the major leagues in payroll. Second lowest. And you look at what they've been able to do with not really much money spent at all. They've been really just chipping away at games, winning close games, which that's a big thing you have to do. If you want to stop being a team with a winning record, you have to win close games. But they still hold the lowest payroll in the major leagues, the lowest total payroll on the year, 43792000 So $44 million just about on the year in their total 2022 payroll. And their current 26-man payroll is third lowest in the MLB. The A's are below that, which I talked about the A's already. They have the worst uh, payroll in the MLB, the lowest payroll, that is, and have the second lowest total payroll in the MLB in 2022. So to reiterate, the Orioles have the lowest total payroll on the year and have the third lowest 26-man payroll. So as I said already in my 
last episode or two episodes ago now, the lowest payroll in baseball for 26-man payrolls is the Oakland Athletics, which right now in spot track, it's at $17.8 million. And if you look at it, they have the second lowest total payroll. And total payroll is the amount of money you've given to guys on your roster throughout the whole entire season. So guys you've already traded away, how much you've paid them, deferred contracts, guys you've already gotten rid of, cut, traded, no matter what it is, guys that are still on your team, guys that are in AAA, that you had on your major league roster, total payroll accounts for that. And then your 26-man payroll is how much money you are spending the current 26 players on your current roster. So right now the Orioles have the third lowest 26-man payroll, 23 million. 987,000, so 24 million. The Pirates have the second lowest 26 man payroll with a 22 man, 26 man payroll. And the Oakland Athletics have a $17.8 million 26 man payroll right now. Then you look at the total payrolls in the MLB on the year. The Orioles have the lowest, 43.7 million. Athletics, 47.7 million. They have second lowest total payroll in the year. So guys have already paid, like Elvis Andrus, Stephen Piscotti. Jed Lowry, guys have already gotten rid of, all account for how much money they've spent in their 2022 total payroll since they were already on their roster, but now we're gone. And that's retained salaries. With Elvis Andrus and Steven Piscotti, they still you know, paid them this season. But what the Orioles have been able to do with the lowest payroll in the major leagues is unreal. Unreal. And if you look at it, they really do have the brightest future. They have the brightest future in baseball, the Orioles, or one of them, if not the brightest, one of them. If you look at what they have for prospects right now, they have six prospects in the top 100 prospects on MLB.com. Six prospects in the top 100 of MLB.com, including two in the top five. Gunnar Henderson, a shortstop slash third baseman in AAA for them, supposed to make it up next year. He's number two overall prospect in the whole entire major league farm system in all of the major leagues. Number four, Grayson Rodriguez, right-handed pitcher for the Orioles in AAA. He is number four overall prospect in the majors. And then Jackson Holiday, first pick of the 2022 MLB draft. He is 14th overall prospect in the top 100 MLB prospects. And that includes, that's three in the top 15, and then have six total in the top 100. And obviously Jackson Holiday is not going to make it up probably for another three years. Very young, he's only 18 years old. But it's very impressive what they have. And if you look at what they've been able to spend, the Orioles haven't spent any money. Obviously. And you can see that, you know, in their current payroll. They spend no money. But if they could just spend $100 million in free agency and spend $165 million like they did in 2017, they're going to be so much more competitive. Six top 100 MLB prospects, and they're only spending right now, the opening day 26-man payroll was $43 million. And if you look at it, they haven't spent over $80 million on their payroll since 2019, the opening day 26 man payroll in 2019 was 80 million. And 2020 was 24 million. And that's obviously because the 2020 season shortened salary since it was only a 60 game season. And 2021, their 26 man opening day payroll was 57 million. And in 2022, 43.7 million on their opening day 26 man payroll. But if you look at it, the Orioles spent 100 plus million on their payroll. On opening day from 2014 to 2018. 2014 spent 107 million on the opening day payroll. In 2015, it was 118 million. 2016, 147 million. 2017 was 164 million. And 2018 was 148 million dollars. So if the Orioles could just spend a hundred million dollars at free agency and have a payroll of about 150 million, let's say, which I know that's still a lot for them, a team that doesn't want to spend, but if they had a payroll at about 150 million. That's what the league average is right now. $150 million is the league average payroll. So if they could just spend $100 million more million than they have on their 2022 total payroll and have $150 million on their total payroll, they're going to have one of the brightest futures in the major leagues already. But if you add in $100 million that they could spend on free agents, the sky is the limit for this Baltimore Orioles team. Just spend $100 million in free agency, have a payroll of $150 million. You got two prospects in the top five in the MLB and number two and number four prospects overall in the top 100 prospects in the major league farm systems. Bring both of those guys up next year. Spend $100 million in free agency to have about $150 million of a payroll, which is the league average. And you'll be so much better off next year. And you already have the best record in the AL since May 17th. 
This Baltimore Orioles team is set up for the future and are going to be very dangerous, very dangerous for the next three to five years. And I'm looking forward to seeing it. They deserve it. The Orioles will be playing the Red Sox tonight in game three of their three-game series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania for the Little League Classic. It'll be tonight, I believe, at 7 o'clock. The Red Sox, Orioles, big game. Obviously, it's 1-1 in the series, so the Red Sox could win another ALE series, which would be huge considering we've only won one now on the year. I know we beat Baltimore in a one-game series a few weeks ago. I don't consider that really a series. So it would be a huge improvement for this Red Sox team to win their second ALE series in a row. Obviously, it could be a lot to ask for, especially considering the Red Sox haven't been able to really play the ALE well all year. And as you can tell by their record in the ALE, it's been a struggle from the start. But speaking of the Little League World Series, Massachusetts was represented by Middleborough, who actually made a really good run in the Little League World Series. Ended up losing, though, unfortunately, to, I believe it was Tennessee in the first game, which they represented the Southeast uh, region. That was Tennessee. They lost in the first round of the World Series to Tennessee, 5-3. to three. And then yesterday, they played an elimination game against Pennsylvania and ended up losing. Pennsylvania was the Mid-Atlantic champion. So they represented the Mid-Atlantic region, and they ended up losing that game 7-5. to five. Actually had a couple guys on base at the end, scored a couple runs in the sixth inning and made it close, but still was not enough. At the end of the day, though, they gave it everything they had, even made it a close game in that elimination game to Pennsylvania yesterday. And at the end of the day, you can't ask for anything more. They made it a close game, had a couple guys on base in that sixth inning, even scored a run or two in the sixth inning to make things interesting. And there were a couple errors by that Pennsylvania team to help them get a couple runs in that sixth. And... And made things close. And at the end of the day, all you really want is a chance in that last inning. And they definitely got that. And more, obviously, putting the tying run up to the plate in that sixth inning with two outs. And didn't work out. But at the end of the day, still a great tournament for them. And not the easiest thing to be going in an elimination game right away. If you win your first game, then you even have a day or two before you play again, I believe. But obviously didn't work out losing the first game to Tennessee and then having to play Saturday against Pennsylvania. That was tough, obviously. But credit to them on a great tournament. Obviously, wish it worked out for them, but it was fun watching them play and obviously represented the New England region very well. Now I'm going to move on, as I was saying, about the Baltimore Orioles having great prospects and obviously being set up well for the future. Now, speaking of another team that has top prospects and can spend a ton in this next upcoming year, the Los Angeles Dodgers. They have seven prospects in the top 100 on MLB.com, and if you look at it, they still have so much money they can still spend, which I'll break down in a minute, the money they have to spend, but I'm going to talk about their prospects first. Diego Cataya, ninth overall prospect on MLB.com, has hit 22 home runs in the minors this year. He had 13 with high A Great Lakes, hit his 13th of the season yesterday with high A Great Lakes, he has 13 on the year now, and that home run he hit was an absolute towering shot that actually bounced out of the stadium. Bounced off the center field, or I think it was left center field concourse. The concrete out there, the concourse, bounced off it and actually went out of the stadium in left field. On the year, he holds a 277 batting average in 49 games with a 949 OPS. And as I said, 13 home runs with high A, Great Lakes, and 22 home runs total on the year. And some of their other prospects are very impressive too, including right-handed pitcher Bobby Miller. He's number 27 on MLB.com's top 100 prospects. Miguel Vargas, a third baseman slash outfielder, number 44 on MLB.com, top 100 prospects. Second baseman slash outfielder, Michael Bush, number 45 on MLB.com. Bush actually hit a moonshot home run yesterday, last night. So just like Kataya hit a huge home run yesterday, Bush also hit a home run yesterday. For the OKC Dodgers, the Oklahoma City Dodgers, in AAA, a 105.9 mile per hour hit off the bat with that exit velocity. Obviously got out in a hurry, 105.9 exit velocity, and went 380 feet. That was the 16th home run of the year with OKC. His 27th home run on the year in the minors. Very impressive prospect there in Michael Bush. And then if you look at it, the Dodgers have four prospects in the top 45 of MLB.com's top 100 prospects. Four in the top 45. And some of their other ones include that aren't in the top five. Some of their other ones included in their top seven and they have seven in the top 100, as I said. So the other three are Andy Pages, the number 69 overall prospect on MLB.com. He's an outfielder. Right-handed pitcher, Ryan Pepio, has a 4.26 ERA 
on the year at 25 and a third innings pitch for the Dodgers. He's currently the number 77 overall prospect on MLB.com. And then the last one of the seven that are in the top 100 on MLB.com, Gavin Stone, right-handed pitcher, number 81 prospect on MLB.com. And if you look at it, seven prospects in the top 100, four in the top 45, the Dodgers could have easily landed Juan Soto if they wanted him. Easily. They have seven prospects in the top 100 prospects on MLB.com. They have the highest 26-man payroll in the MLB and also have the highest 2022 total team payroll. They've spent $264 million on their total 2022 payroll, which is number one in the MLB, and have a 26-man payroll right now of $207 million, which is also number one in the MLB. They are set up now to win right now and also for many years to come. They're set up to win right now and for many years to come. That's hard to do. It's hard to pick just one of them. If you want to win now, sometimes that comes at the cost of winning in years to come. Like the Red Sox went all in on 2018, won the World Series, had a couple tougher seasons after that. Missed the playoffs in 2019, and then 2020 obviously was a tough season too. Recovered well in 2021 though. And sometimes it's, it's the reverse, where if you don't want to win now and you're trying to set up for years to come, you could be like the Baltimore Orioles and struggle for the last four to five to six years. So you have to choose sometimes to win now or try to win for many years to come. And the Dodgers are one of the most well-run organizations in all of sports. They are set up to win right now and are set up to win many years to come. And you don't see that really in many teams in baseball. And if you think about it, you don't see that many teams in general in all of sports that are set up to win now and for the next five to ten years. And I'm not sure what the Dodgers are going to look like in five to ten years. But I'm telling you right now, this team will be a World Series contender easily for the next three to five years. And who knows even beyond that. But if you look at how well they've been able to draft and how well they've been able to use their payroll, they're not afraid to make a big move, make a big trade for Mookie Betts, make a big free agent signing for Freddie Freeman. They are not afraid to try to win. Last year, trading for Trey Turner and Max Scherzer at the deadline, they are not afraid to win. This Dodgers team wants to win. They're set up to win now, and they're set up to win in the future for many years to come. They're not afraid to spend money, and they're not afraid to go all in to win now and also give up some of their prospects in the future. They've traded some prospects away. Gina Downs, Connor Wong, Alex Rodugo is a former top prospect of theirs, but Gina Downs, Connor Wong, those are some of their bigger prospects. Maybe not their highest, but they were prospects in their system, and they weren't afraid to trade those guys to get Mookie Betts. And if you look at it, it's not even like they traded their top prospects away because they still have seven in the top 100 on MLB.com. And now I'm going to talk about their money. They're not afraid to spend money already as is with all the big salaries they have on their team. But after this season ends, they have expiring contracts on a lot of guys. They won't have left-handed pitcher David Price on their payroll after this year. He's due for $16 million this season, so he's off the payroll after this year. Trey Turner, shortstop, $21 million one-year deal is what he's on right now, arbitration deal. He'll be a free agent after this year. Clayton Kershaw, $17 million one-year deal. He'll be off the payroll after this year. Craig Kimbrell, $16 million. will be off the payroll at the end of this year. Joey Gallo, $10 million salary. I know most of that was paid by the Yankees this year. He'll be off the payroll after this year. Then you add in club options for the 2023 season. So for next year, they have club options as a team. So the front office can make a decision on Max Muncy. He's getting $13 million this year for his salary. And then Justin Turner, $16 million salary this year. And Muncy, I think they'll let go. He's hitting 186 on the year with 15 home runs, a 323 batting average, and a 698 OPS. He had 36 home runs with a 249 batting average of 2021. He was actually 10th in NL MVP voting last year, 10th in the National League. But he's not the same player this year. 186 batting average, 15 home runs, 323 on base percentage, and a 698 OPS. And you look at Justin Turner, he's 37 years old right now, will be 38 in a few weeks in September, hitting 255 on the year with nine home runs, just nine home runs with a 729 OPS. He had 278 last year with 27 home runs. He's not the same player he was last year either. So Turner Muncy, both of those guys are not the same player that they were last year. They're just not. And it's obviously tough for the Dodgers because those are two guys that have been with them for years now and been a big part of their success. Justin Turner's numbers are down and Max Muncy's numbers are down. And if you look at the age of Justin Turner, he'll be 38 coming up 
on November 23rd. So I know I said September, but it's November. November 23rd, he'll be 38. So by the start of next season, he'll be 38 years old. 38 years old. And you look at Max Muncy, he's not having a good year at all. 186 batting average, a 375 slugging percentage. His slugging percentage last year was 527. And if I had to guess, I don't think the Dodgers pick up the club option on Max Muncy or Justin Turner. And the reason why I say that is, obviously they're struggling this year, both of those guys. Turner's getting 16 million this year. Muncy's getting 13 million. Not that much, especially with two guys that have contributed a ton to the franchise over the last few years. Won a World Series with them in 2020. And we're a big part of that, both of them. But they have so many prospects, the Dodgers, that are coming up. And of those seven prospects I named, one of them already made it up. Ryan Pepio, the pitcher. But if you look at what they have for prospects that are coming up in the next year, they're going to take the position of Justin Turner and Max Muncy. They have third baseman slash outfielder Miguel Vargas, outfielder Andy Pages, and second baseman slash outfielder Michael Bush, all coming up in the next year, whether it's now or in the next year to take their positions. So from now and next September or next August, next July, whenever it is. I don't know the timeline, really, since when prospects are called up, no one really ever knows. It really just happens whenever the front office thinks it's time. Whether the major league club has a big need or a guy that's in AAA that's a top prospect of theirs that has been raking, and they have no option but to bring him up since he's better than what they have at the major league level right now. And if you look at it, Andy Pages, Michael Bush, Miguel Vargas, they'll all be up by the 2023 season. So at some point in the 2023 season, or maybe by the end of this year, but I think probably by the 2023 season, some point in the 2023 season, all three of those guys will be on the Major League roster. And all three of those guys could take the position of Max Muncy or Justin Turner. And it's not even just because those guys are top prospects, but if you look at Justin Turner and Max Muncy both having down years and a down in average, with Justin Turner having a 278 batting average last year, and that was a 255 batting average this year. A 249 batting average for Max Muncy last year. He's a 186 batting average this year. Home runs wise, they're down. 27 home runs for Turner last year. He only has nine this year. 36 home runs for Muncy last year. He only has 15 this year. And an OPS. 832 OPS last year for Justin Turner. He's a 729 OPS this year. And an 895 OPS last year for Max Muncy. He only has a 698 OPS on the year. So Muncy's OPS is down nearly 200 points while Turner's is down 100 points. And both of their home run numbers and averages are down too. And their home run numbers, at least for Turner, significantly. And same thing for Muncy, 36 home runs to 15. Turner, 27 to 9. Both of those numbers are down heavily. So let's say they don't bring back David Price, Trey Turner, Craig Kimbrell, or Joey Gallo. And they decline the club options on Max Muncy and Justin Turner. The Dodgers will have $92 million saved up and ready to spend. And I didn't include Clayton Kershaw as a player they'd move on from since realistically, if he does come back, which I think he's going to come back another season, he's been playing great this year. I know he's hurt right now, but he's had a great season. Was the NL All-Star starter at Dodger Stadium. They'll probably keep him on another one-year deal. So I didn't keep him in money that save. But the Dodgers can spend $100 million in free agency next year after the season ends and have all seven of their top 100 prospects on MLB.com join them by the end of this season or at some point next season. And as I said, Ryan Pepio, the pitcher, already was promoted. So six of their other six top 100 prospects on MLB.com will all likely make it up in the next year. And they already have Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, Tony Gonsolin, Walker Bueller. He's out for the rest of this season, probably out for most of 2023 as well. Dustin May, returning from 2021 Tommy John surgery. Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman. I mean, this team is stacked, stacked. And if they wanted Juan Soto, they could have had him. Money-wise, they could have paid him anything they, that he wanted and could have given up the price of whatever he is to in a trade since they have seven prospects in the top 100. But obviously, they valued those prospects more than getting Juan Soto, and I respect that at the end of the day, especially considering how competent of a front office they have. If they decide not to trade for him, no one can fault them for that. Obviously, Juan Soto is a great player, but the Dodgers know what they're doing. They've built themselves up to win right now and to win in the future. So no one can really question any move they make. And speaking of a team that has a lot in their farm system and were in the conversation to get Juan Soto, the St. Louis Cardinals, they could have had Juan Soto as well. 
There's six prospects in the top 100 on MLB.com, including number six overall prospect on MLB.com, third baseman slash outfielder Jordan Walker, who they did not want to trade. Walker was the guy they did not want to trade, and that's a big reason that deal never happened. They chose to not send their six top prospects in the top 100 of MLB.com. And one of them, left-handed pitcher Matthew Libertor, number 85 prospect on MLB.com, has a 5-3-3 ERA in seven games this year in the majors. But that was another guy they didn't want to part ways with, and I respect that. And while I'm speaking of the Cardinals, Albert Pujols became the first player in MLB history with four hits and two homers in the same game at the age of 42 or older. And credit to Bob Nightingale for that stat. He's hit five home runs in his last five games, and he's getting closer to the 700 benchmark. The 700 home run benchmark that only three other players in MLB history have ever achieved in the history of baseball. He has 692 career home runs, and on the year, has an 847 OPS. Since August 10th, Albert Pujols has six home runs. The Philadelphia Phillies only have five since August 10th. The Texas Rangers only have five since August 10th. And the Red Sox only have three. Albert Pujols on the year hit 269 with 13 home runs, 37 runs batted in, a 345 on base percentage, a 513 slugging percentage, and an 858 OPS with a 145 OPS plus. If he were a qualified batter, his 145 plus OPS, his OPS plus, 145 OPS plus, would be 12th best in the major leagues. Same OPS plus as Shohei Otani. He also has a 145 OPS plus. In his last nine games, Albert Pujols is 14 for 26 with a 539 batting average, a 586 on base percentage, and a 1.269 slugging percentage, a 1269 slugging percentage, a 1855, a 1.855 OPS with six home runs, 13 RBIs, and seven runs scored in his last nine games played. He has been on a tear. And he still said he's going to retire after the year no matter what. And he's looking as good as he's looked for the last five years in his last nine games. He is locked in right now. And it definitely started with the home run derby. Started getting hot then. Obviously made it to the semifinals, which I don't even think he expected to make it out of the first round. Beating Kyle Schwarber, which was a shock. But he's getting hot at the right time for this Cardinals team. And I know he's not an everyday player for them right now. But I'm really hoping he can hit that 700 home run benchmark. As I said, only three other players in MLB history have hit it before. And I'm hoping he becomes one of them. So now I'm going to transition to the Red Sox. They lost a tough one on Friday night to the Orioles. Tough loss there. Heading into Friday's game since July 1st, the Orioles had a 26-15 record with a 251 team batting average since July 1st, a plus 31 run differential, and a 4.09 starting ERA with a 3.17 bullpen ERA and 18 errors since July 1st. Then you look at the Red Sox, and credit to Nesson for these stats. Red Sox since July 1st heading into Friday night, 16 and 27 record with a 236 team batting average, a minus 91 run differential, minus 91 run differential since July 1st, a 5.81 starting ERA, a 5.5 bullpen ERA, and 27 errors committed. 27 errors committed since July 1st. And if you look at Friday night, the Sox were down 10 to 4 in the top of the fifth inning. Scored five runs and were right back in it, actually, in the top of the fifth. Heading into the top of the fifth, they were down 10 to 4. They scored five runs in the top of the fifth, made it a 10 to 9 game. They scored five runs, were right back in it after Tommy Pham bases clearing, three run double, huge hit for him. He's been playing great for the Red Sox since they traded for him with a trade with the Cincinnati Reds. But then they gave up five runs in the bottom half of the fifth inning, and that was the end of the game. They gave up in four consecutive innings three runs, three runs, four runs, five runs. Three runs the Red Sox gave up in the bottom of the second. Three in the third, four in the fourth, and five in the fifth. That is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And then they end up losing the game 15 to 10. And in that game, Cutter Crawford started the game for the Red Sox, gave up nine earned runs in just three and two thirds innings pitched. That was actually the 12th game this season that the Red Sox allowed 10 plus runs. Fifth most games in the major leagues this year, allowing 10 plus runs. Behind only the Nationals, Royals, Rockies, and Reds. Washington, Kansas City, Colorado, and Cincinnati. Four teams that are not going anywhere this season and aren't contending for anything. They are not contending for anything, those four teams. But a high draft pick. That's about it. 
In that game, though, Alex Verdugo was 3-for-6 with an RBI run scored. Christian Arroyo was 3-for-5 with two runs scored and an RBI. And then Rob Ref Snyder, who should be in the lineup more in my opinion, was 3-for-4 with a double, two runs scored, and an RBI. And also was on base with a walk. So he was on base four or five plate appearances. Very good night for Ref Snyder, Verdugo, and Arroyo. The Sox are 12-16 and 16 since the All-Star break with 115 runs scored and 168 runs allowed, a minus 63 run differential. After being 8-19 and 19 in July, the Sox are 9-9 nine and nine in August and have already surpassed their whole entire July win total. Eight wins in July, they already have nine in August. And in the last six games, the Sox are 4-2. So things are looking a little bit up, even with that Friday night loss and losing that game three to the Pirates. A big win yesterday. Helped out the Red Sox. And you look at it, Christian Arroyo and Alex Verdugo have been unreal for the Red Sox in the month of August. And they're a big reason the Red Sox have been afloat in the last six games, being 4-2. and two. Between the two of those guys, they have 45 hits between the two of them in August, hitting 368 with 13 runs batted in and 9 walks. Since August 5th, in 14 games, Alex Verdugo is hitting 434, a 434 batting average, 23 hits for 61 at-bats, so 23 for 61, with a 508 on base percentage, a 642 slugging percentage, and a 1.150, an 1150 OPS, 1.150 OPS, with 12 runs scored, 6 RBIs, 7 walks to 6 strikeouts. So he's walked one more time than he struck out in his last 14 games. With a home run, 8 doubles, and a 478 batting average on balls in play. He has 7 multi-hit games in August, and in 18 games in August, he's reached base at least three times in six games. Then you look at Christian Arroyo. Since returning from the injured list on July 30th, in 19 games played since then, he's in 397 for a batting average, 29 for 73 at the plate, with a 429 on base percentage, a 548 slugging percentage, a 977 OPS, with a home run, six doubles, a triple, 10 runs scored, nine runs batted in, and a 446 batting average on balls in play. He has been elite at the plate. 397 batting average in the last 19 games since July 30th. And then you look at Verdugo in his last 14 games, hitting 434. And in the month of August, has reached base three times, at least three times in six games out of 18. So one third of the games in August, he's reached base at least three times. Verdugo and Arroyo have been unreal for the Red Sox over the past two and a half weeks. And the Red Sox need it. So big game tonight for the Red Sox. As I said, it's a Little League classic between the Orioles and the Red Sox. The Red Sox have Nick Pavetta on the mound. Big start for him. He actually played very well in his last mound appearance, and the Red Sox really need it. The Red Sox need him to play better, especially considering this is a big part of the Red Sox schedule. they got to make up games. They have about 12 or 13 series left. If I remember what uh, Tom Karen was saying on Friday night, but they will be playing Dean Kramer, he will be starting for the Orioles. And then you look at the Red Sox, Nick Pavetta on the mound. Big game for this Red Sox team. Hopefully they can get a win in front of the Little League crowd. It'll be a very good game, obviously, especially considering it could be another ALE series win for this Red Sox team. They could steal another ALE series win. And it'll be big. The Orioles are ahead of the Red Sox. So any teams ahead of you now, you need to beat in head-to-head games. And the Red Sox have a chance. They play the Orioles again today, as I said. Have another series coming up against the Blue Jays. And if you look at the Red Sox schedule... They still play some teams that are ahead of them. Play the Rays, the Blue Jays and Rays this week, then the Twins the week after. So that's one, two, three. Three games against the Blue Jays, three games against the Rays, both of those series being at home, and then they go to Minnesota for three. So that's nine games against teams that are ahead of you. Nine games. Three against Toronto at home, three against Tampa Bay at home, and then three on the road against the Minnesota Twins. So the Red Sox have a big chance here to gain games. And obviously a game tonight against the Orioles. So the next 10 games, one tonight and then the next nine after that, are all against teams ahead of them. So they need a big start of Nick Pavetta. Now to some other news in the MLB. Mike Trout returned to the lineup for the Angels on Friday. His first game back since July 12th. He was out with a back injury since then. He was 1-4 for with a single on his first at bat. The Angels won the game 1-0. Obviously, as I've talked about this whole summer, Mike Trout and Shohei Otani deserve better. And I've been wishing nothing but the best of both of those guys this season. As I've said, every single night, both of those guys touch the field. There's a chance you're going to see something that doesn't happen in MLB history. I mean, both of those 
Guys, every single time they touch the field, you have the chance to watch something historic. And that's why I think both of those guys are two of the most exciting players in baseball. And that's why I think the Angels are still a team worthy of watching, even with all their struggles. Because every single night, Otani and Trout suit up, especially in the same lineup, you have the chance of witnessing history. You have a chance. The chance of a lifetime to see something that hasn't happened in the last hundred years, when you have both those guys in the same lineup. Two of the best players in baseball, the two best players in baseball, when they're both healthy and locked in, in my opinion. And you get the chance of watching them do something great every single night, night in and night out. And speaking of Otani, two-way superstar Shohei Otani has reached base at least three times in five games out of 17 games in the month of August. So he's reached base three-plus times in five games out of 17. So... Very good month of August for him. In his last 31 games since July 13th, he's hitting 296 for batting average, 34 for 115. With a 393 on base percentage, a 600 slugging percentage, a 993 OPS, a 338 batting average on balls in play, with 18 runs scored since July 13th, three doubles, four triples, eight home runs, 18 runs batted in, and six intentional walks, which is very impressive. Six intentional walks in his last 31 games. So once every five games, just about. Once every six games, he's walked intentionally since no one wants to face him. Especially considering in a high leverage situation when the game's in the line, no one wants to pitch to Shohei Otani. No one wants to pitch to him. And if you look at it, in his last 10 games, he's 15 for 37 at the plate with a 405 batting average, seven runs scored, a double, two triples in his last 10 games, three home runs, seven RBIs, a 488 on base percentage, a 784 slugging percentage. A 1.272, a 1.272 OPS, so 12.72 OPS, with a 5.46 batting average on balls in play. In his last 10 games, 5.46 batting average on balls in play. So if he puts the ball in play, it's realistically going to be a hit. The Angels since the All-Star break at 13-15, 13 wins, 15 losses. They were 6-18 and 18 in the month of July. 6 wins, 18 losses in 24 games in the month of July. But they've already surpassed their July win total. By three games already, with nine wins in August. Nine and nine in the month of August, which is very good for them. Five and five in their last 10 games, and 10 and 10 in their last 20 games. And on the year, the Angels are 10 and 20 in one-run games. So if you look at it, they've been so unlucky in one-run games. 10 wins in 31 run games. They've played 30 games this year that have been decided by one run, and they've only won 10. So they've only won one-third of their games decided by one run. 10 wins, 20 losses in 30 games. If 10 of those games that they lost went their way and they were, let's say, 20 and 10 in their 20 wins, 10 losses in their 31 run games, it would be a much different season outcome for them. And they'd be in a much different position right now. But regardless, I'd still be watching every single night, whether they're in the playoffs, out of the playoffs, already eliminated, trying to clinch a playoff spot. No matter what the situation is, I will still watch every time Shoei Otani and Mike Charter on TV. Because as I said... You have the chance of watching something historic happen every single time both those guys touch the field. Speaking of some teams that have been struggling this season, one team that's turned it around at least a little bit, the Chicago Cubs hold the sixth best record in the major leagues in the past 30 games with an 18-12 record in the last 30 games played. As I said, that's sixth best in the MLB. 11-9 in their last 20 games, which is eighth best in the MLB. They are 8-2 and two in their last 10 games played, which is actually tied for second best in all of baseball. So that's one thing to watch. The Cubs didn't rip it all up at the trade deadline. Kept Wilson Contreras and Ian Happ. Both of those guys were expected to be traded. Kept both of them and it seemed to work out for them. 18-12 in their last 30 games played. So it worked out for the Cubs. Now I'm going to talk about the World Baseball Classic really quick. So joining Team USA... Pete Alonso just announced a couple days ago he will be playing for them, joining Captain Mike Trout, Bryce Hopper, Nolan Arenado, JT Ramudo, Trevor Story, Paul Goldschmidt, and now Pete Alonso. That is a Team USA roster as of now. And then Mark DeRosa will be managing for Team USA. He played on Team USA in the World Baseball Classic in 2009. He's currently an MLB Network analyst and a former major leaguer. He held a 751 career OPS with 100 home runs and 494 runs batted in and 1,241 career games in the MLB in 16 seasons. So, very experienced baseball player, obviously 16 games, has been an MLB network analyst for some years now. And obviously, 
with that experience, 16 years in the MLB, obviously working as an MLB network analyst for the last few years, he deserves it. And he's definitely qualified enough, especially considering how much he knows about the game of baseball, whether it's being an analyst for MLB Network or it's playing for 16 years. He's known the game of baseball, the ins and out of it, whether it's being a player in the dugout or it's being an MLB Network analyst and working for MLB Network and breaking down games, talking about at-bats. Whether it's breaking down film as a player, since he knows what it's like, or it's being an MLB Network analyst as a studio analyst which he's been with the MLB Network now since 2013. He was a guest analyst at first on MLB Network, and now has a job there, obviously, working for just about nine years now. So he knows the ins and outs of the game. He's very experienced, and he's more than qualified. So I'm excited to see him be the manager of Team USA, especially considering he played for Team USA in 2009. And he said it was one of the best experiences he had in the game of baseball. So it's very exciting to him. Congratulations to him. Excited to see what Team USA looks like. One other player that announced that he will be playing in the World Baseball Classic is Astros second baseman Jose Altuve. He announced he will be playing for Venezuela in the World Baseball Classic. He last played for them in 2017, which was actually the last World Baseball Classic. Venezuela finished eighth in 2017. And now that you think of it, with a lot of stars playing, like the ones I already named, Trevor Story, Paul Goldschmidt, Pete Alonso, Bryce Hopper, Owen Arenado, Mike Trout, Pete Alonso, Freddie Freeman for Team Canada. With all of these stars playing, I'm excited to see who will be MVP of it. Altuve, Story, Arenado, Hopper, Trout, Alonzo, Goldschmidt. There's so many stars playing. Freddie Freeman. And that's only who's been announced so far. Still a long ways to go. And if you look at it, I was just looking at the former MVPs of it. Former Red Sox pitcher Dice K. Matsuzaka was the MVP of the World Baseball Classic in 2006 and in 2009, playing for Japan, which is exciting. Two times he was the MVP. In 2013, the MVP was Robinson Cano, playing for the Dominican Republic. And then in 2017, the MVP was Marcus Stroman, pitching for the U.S. So I'm excited to see who else is going to play. I'm excited to see how the World Baseball Classic goes. As I said, it'll be March of 2023, so still got a ways to go, but I'm excited to see what the outcome of it is. Anyways, thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you, as always. Hope you guys had a great weekend as well. I appreciate it. Hope you guys have a good one. Thank you.